Hi, it's Chris Wallace here. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm really pleased today to talk with uh, Dr. Seam Friedland of Cedar sinai uh, in L.A. about his uh, work on the Embark uh, study, which has been published just this past month and really um, is changing the landscape for patients with uh, high-risk biochemically recurrent uh, prostate cancer. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Friedland. Well, thanks so much, Chris, for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So oh, maybe as a, a bit of background, tell us, you know, why this study came to be. What, what was the rationale? Why did you guys embark on this effort? Uh... <laughs> Pun intended. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we know, you know, that biochemical occurrence, so having had surgery, radiation, PSA should be zero or very low. And unfortunately, for about a third of patients, give or take, it's not after surgery. They develop this rising PSA, those biochemical occurrence. And, and some have argued this is the most common form of advanced prostate cancer that we see actually in the field. And we know that PSA doubling time, the rate at which PSA rises, extremely prognostic. And specifically those with a doubling time less than nine months are at high risk of developing bio, uh, metastasis and ultimately dying of their disease. And once you've uh, gone through the salvage local therapies, we really don't have good options for these men. So that they undergo observation, and at a certain point, they undergo systemic therapy, traditionally with ADT alone. Uh, we know in more advanced settings, in metastatic castrate-sensitive prostate cancer, for example, adding a novel hormonal agent like enzalutamide significantly delays progression, doesn't worsen quality of life, and improves overall survival. So that was the fundamental question we were asking, is can we use that same regimen, ADT, plus enzalutamide, or even enzalutamide alone in even earlier stage disease in this high-risk biochemical recurrence setting. Absolutely. So maybe you can briefly walk us through. What did, what did the trial find? So what we did is we took men with this high-risk biochemical recurrence, randomized to enzalutamide combination, so enza plus ADT, ADT alone, or enzalutamide alone, enza monotherapy. And the primary outcome was metastasis-free survival, so metastasis or death. And basically, both of the enzalutamide arms, with or without ADT, dramatically reduced the risk of metastasis-free survival, improved time to PSA progression, time to next therapy, time to metastasis. Um, and there were suggestions of overall survival benefits. It was very immature early on the overall survival, so neither of those reached statistical significance but across the board, many key secondary endpoints were met. And when we looked at the quality of life, it seemed to be preserved, meaning you didn't have to sacrifice your quality of life to get these oncological benefits. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm interested in maybe hoping your insights on the way that you guys approached the systemic therapy here. So, you know, uh, you're talking about hormone therapy being one of the standards of care, and clearly uh, luprolide was the, the control arm here. Intermittent ADT has been widely used here. So maybe talk a little bit about how you guys approach when to stop and when to reinitiate systemic therapy in the trial. Yeah, no, it, it's a great point, Chris. And that's actually something unique and very interesting about Embark. So when we look at more advanced settings, MCSPC, it's basically lifelong ADT and novel hormonal therapy until you progress. Typically, it's three years or so of novel hormonal therapy continuously. So here, because they're non-metastatic, because therapy does have some side effects and toxicity, because intermittent is being used out in the real world, what we the way Embark was designed is that you would get 36 weeks of this therapy. And if the PSA was less than 0.2, if you got a good response, therapy was held. And it was then restarted when the PSA got above um, two post-surgery and above five post-radiation. And you would go then go back onto the arm you're originally assigned to. And what's interesting is, first off, that a lot more patients on the enzalutamide arms reached that uh, treatment suspension. So over 90% on combination reached it, over 85% on enzalutamide monotherapy, but only two-thirds, 67%. On ADT alone, reached that treatment suspension. And then if you got that treatment suspension on the combination, it lasted for 20 months on average. So eight months of therapy 
about you 20 months off therapy. Now we have testosterone levels. So we're starting to look, you know, how long does it take T to recover and different things we're looking at. Um, but with ADT alone, it was 16 months. And with monotherapy, it was actually 11 months. It was the shortest amount of time, but you have normal testosterone that whole time. So the minute you stop your therapy, that testosterone's there, it can start stimulating the PSA and the tumor growth. But either way, on average, the off cycle was longer than the treatment cycle. Now we didn't do a classic intermittent, like once they went back on therapy, they stayed on therapy. We didn't have another off treatment cycle. I mean, it'll certainly be interesting to see in the real world how this is, is picked up, but you know, it's, it's, gets challenging in a clinical trial to have multiple off cycles. And, you know, it's really intensified versus not. We weren't asking an intermittent ADT question. Right. Fair enough. And maybe, you know, talk to us a little bit about this notion of uh, enzalutamide monotherapy up until maybe the ENACT trial, which didn't really change practice recently. We've always seen these, you know, advanced uh, engine receptor signaling agents in combination with an ADT backbone, but both the rationale for it and what do you think about the toxicity? Because certainly that's one of the concerns. Yeah. So, I mean, if you take a, a bigger picture historical perspective, um, bicalutamide 150 milligrams was a standard treatment for prostate cancer. <clears throat> and there was a study, the early prostate cancer study that actually showed in men on active surveillance, <clears throat> so an observation, not getting any therapy for prostate cancer, that those getting bicalutamide 150 had a higher risk of death. And I would argue that would have been true with any ADT in a active surveillance cohort. So it's not necessarily that bicalutamide 150 was so toxic, it's just ADT in men, um, you know, who really shouldn't be getting anything. And based on that, it was taken off the market and, and kind of viewed as, as verboten, as, as bad in the US. It's still used in Europe, the, cap, the bicalutamide 150. And so I think it's, it's paying homage to the roots in terms of oral monotherapy. Um, but you're right, this is the first phase three clinical trial that's looked at a novel hormonal agent alone without ADT. And what we see is the efficacy is better than ADT alone. The quality of life is preserved on a global level. Um, sexual activity was better preserved than ADT alone, which I think is gonna be the selling point for a lot of men. Keep in mind that with Embark, median age was 70. Three quarters had had surgery before, which can impact obviously erectile function. And 50%, so two thirds of that 75, <clears throat> had had surgery and radiation. So, you know, if you have a young, healthy patient who's sexually active and, and able to maintain that despite surgery or radiation, I think this is a, a significant consideration. When we look at the toxicity, um, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, monotherapy is great. It has less toxicity. No, that's not true. It's not less. It's different toxicity. And I think that's the key point is it's different. So you do have a lot less hot flashes. And if hot flashes are really, really bothersome and someone on combination, that's something you could think about is taking off the loop, the luprolide and keeping the enzalutamide alone. If we look at fatigue, it was about the same. Um, if we look at breast tenderness, gynecomastia, much higher with the enzymonotherapy. Now we didn't have any pre-specified radiation to the breast or tamoxifen or anything that you might think of to try and mitigate that. So that's gonna be something we're gonna to have to think about as, as monotherapy is now FDA approved and people start using it is what mitigation strategies can we use to try and prevent some of those side effects. Um, but the key point is the side effects are different. They're not less, they're just different.